Welcome to the 2023 Virtual College Fed Challenge. We've already read your team ID, um, so thanks con for confirming that. Advisors, alternates, and spectators, please mute yourself and do not show yourself on video. Team, are all your presenters present and ready to go? Okay. Yes. Um, just a reminder, do not have any school identifiers in your WebEx. Um, and we're going to go over a few rules. When you're not speaking, it's a good idea to mute so your sound is clear. We are recording today's session for final judging. You may have your slides up that were used during your presentation submitted in October, but you should not have updated the data within. The economy is essentially locked in when you submitted that video. Today, if you verbally reference updated data, it will not help your team or hurt a team score that does not do the same. No new slides or data should be introduced within your PowerPoint presentation. In a few minutes, we're going to start a timer, and Sophia will state two minutes and end verbally. This may interrupt your sentence, but please allow it. Jose, can you verify we're recording? Yes, recording's confirmed. Great. Judges, can you verify you have the two common questions? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, judges, for your time. If we're ready, we'll start the timer now. Okay, so your first question, and feel free to ask me to repeat anything, is um, over the past one and a half years, the Federal Reserve has increased its policy rate at a pace that is unprecedented by modern standards. Taking into consideration economic conditions at the start of the tightening cycle, what is your group's assessment of the costs and benefits of such a strategy versus some alternative of your choosing? How would you describe the effects to date? Great question. So the Fed began raising its policy rate in March 2022, and it's gone from zero to uh, 25 basis points up to 5.25 to 525 to 550 basis points, which, as you mentioned, is unprecedented. We generally believe the Fed's pace and level of tightening has has been apt throughout, uh, even though it's possible the Fed should have started earlier. So the costs and benefits to this are twofold. On on the cost side. There are recessionary risks, and we have seen a dramatic softening of the labor market as a result of this, as well as a tightening of credit conditions that has put stresses on the financial system. And on the benefit side, we have seen a dramatic decrease or a moderate decrease in core inflation and a dramatic decrease in headline inflation, perhaps attributable to that labor market softening. So going forward, um, we think that the policy rate is as as it's currently as current level is, is wise, depending on incoming data, it may change. And we think that the Fed's main tool overall is its policy rate and alongside communication, that's what it should have been using and that's what it's used. And just to speak a little more to the cost of this tightening. So we saw that in the period prior, there were actually pretty low interest rates, which led pension funds and bank portfolios to exhibit a reach for yield behavior in which they increased their exposure to duration and interest rate risk. So we saw, for instance, in the Silicon uh, Valley bank crisis earlier this year, when there was very quick tightening, this led to these bank um, bank portfolios that were exposed to these risks to actually uh, face significant instability because their asset prices were devalued. Nevertheless, with various programs such as the bank term funding program or the discount window, we think that the Fed also successfully managed to contain this crisis, so ultimately it did not become a larger crisis in the economy. As to the overall pace of tightening, we think that the Fed's sort of approach of being data dependent is prudent. If you use, for example, a simple Taylor rule calibration when headline inflation was in the range of 9%, it would imply, you know, a necessary federal funds rate to bring inflation back down to target of substantially above 5.25. However, the Fed recognized that one, increasing the federal funds rate is sort of one off event would exacerbate financial instability concerns, as Megan mentioned, so that wouldn't be prudent. And two, monetary theory is not always perfect. And so looking at incoming data as it evolved is a more sort of sensible approach. For example, not many economists predicted the labor market dynamics we've seen over the past year, where, for example, the unemployment rate has remained relatively constant, but vacancies and other demand side measures of labor market tightness have come down substantially. And so we think that the Fed's data dependent approach is, uh, is warranted. And to elaborate on the labor supply side, uh, we've seen that uh, LFPR among prime age males and females have risen back up and are actually now above pre-pandemic levels. We're seeing that uh, LFPR also among Black and Hispanic workers are have recovered significantly, and that's been beneficial in our quest to bring labor demand and supply side factors into greater balance. At the same time, when you look at inflation, if you decompose core inflation into its 
sub into its uh, requisite parts into core services, X housing, uh, core housing and core goods. You'll see that core goods inflation declined dramatically is actually coming in at 0.1% year over year now compared to kind of uh, above 5% when we started the hiking cycle. We're seeing that core services inflation is still elevated at around 3.5% and we see that as uh, part of the reflecting the labor market tightness um, that we alluded to earlier. And so we'll have to see that come into greater balance uh, for our kind of inflation fight to be over. To quickly wrap that up, you mentioned alternative policies the Fed might have used. We, we do think the policy rate was the correct way to go. Um, of course, uh, in, in combination with quantitative tightening, which has tightened financial conditions as well, um, that could have been an alternative for the Fed to lean more heavily on. But those two in, <clears throat> those two in tandem seem to have worked well. And raising the short-term rate seems to have fed back through the economy in a way that the Fed would have wanted it to. Any further questions before we move on to the next one? Nope. Great. All right, so since reaching a peak of 7.1% in June 2022, the 12-month PC inflation rate uh, that the Fed targets declined to 3.5% as of August of this year. Um, Many observers and market participants um, expressed that they were surprised that this reduction in inflation has been seen without the U.S. economy having undergone a recession. So I guess two questions here. What would the group say is a basis for this surprise? And secondly, does the success in reducing inflation so far suggest to you that reaching the Fed's 2% longer run goal will be easy? Yeah, just to elaborate a bit more on the theoretical basis. So if we look at the Phillips curve, where it shows the, the relationship between inflation and unemployment, usually to bring down inflation, we need to see an increase in unemployment and it could lead to recessionary risk as well as Chiketti et al, for instance, found that um, central bank induced disinflations often tend to lead to recessions happening as well. However, in this case, we saw that because the reduction in inflation was largely brought about by supply side factors. So, for example, a paper by Bernanke and Blanchard in 2023 found that supply side um, resolving of supply side constraints such as the supply side, um, the manufacturing constraints and supply shocks that happened during the pandemic, these were the key contributors to the decline in inflation. And it has contributed to, to the so-called immaculate disinflation that we have seen so far. Moving forward, however, we think that as the Bernanke and Blanchard paper said, because labor markets may still be tighter than before, um, we think that this could possibly be an inflationary risk that may be harder to resolve without a recession. Even though, as, Meg, as Megan mentioned, most of the reduction in headline inflation that we've seen has come from the normalization of supply side factors, we have seen a substantial decline in core CPI and core CP, uh, PCE. Why this has happened um, without sort of an increase in unemployment or more broadly sort of uh, greater, greater indicators of recession, we think has a lot to do with the specific nature of the bev uh, the labor market and specifically the beverage curve in the pandemic and post pandemic period. There's a lot of talk in throughout 2022 of the outward shift of the beverage curve and, you know, the increase in V over U um, up to a, a high of two. Um, since then, we've seen the beverage curve shift back inwards and more broadly measure of labor demand like V over U, uh, like vacancies, like jobs quits come back down closer to their pre-pandemic levels without an increase in unemployment. One reason for that is that the outward shift in the beverage curve may have been induced by sort of COVID-specific idiosyncrasies. For example, there's a recent NBR working paper released in October by Barlevi et al. that posits that the increase in on-the-job switching as measured by the quits rate increased labor reallocation and decreased matching efficiency, which, in, which shifted the beverage curve outward. As we've seen the on-the-job switching um, become less prevalent since 2022, that would imply a reduction in vacancies and therefore reduction in labor market tightness and a lowering of nominal wages, which we've seen, for example, in the October uh, uh, jobs report, we saw average hourly earnings coming in at 2.5% uh, month over month annualized, which is consistent with the cooling labor market and thus cooling core inflation. As Bet and Menigan mentioned, the, this has mainly been driven, we think, by supply and demand renormalizing, both overall in the real economy with supply shocks declining, thus decreasing inflation without decrease, increasing unemployment, as well as labor supply and demand coming into greater balance. Going forward, however, 
we're we're a bit skeptical that these factors exactly will be able to contribute to disinflation. So vacancies seem unlikely to be able to come down that much further without some increase in unemployment and supply side factors seem to have kind of reverted to their base effects to the point that we can't rely on more supply side normalization. We're still bullish because we think that incoming housing data, which is lagged, suggests coming disinflation in the data. And we also think that anchored inflation expectations um, around, you know, the, the break evens for five year out and 10 year out are hovering around 2%, meaning the market expects the Fed to get back and we don't expect a wage price spiral. We do think inflation has a risk of stabilizing around three if, if those housing factors don't really come through. And that's why the Fed needs to be data dependent going forward. And if it sees inflation rising or stagnating, it needs to be willing to raise its policy rate and further tighten the economy. And to sum it all up, when you have this uh, Phillips curve that's augmented with inflation expectations or with labor demand side factors to measure labor market tightness rather than unemployment, which is a labor supply side factor, you, you do see this kind of linear relationship trade off between having a tighter labor market and having higher inflation. And so going forward, we're going to have to see labor demand side factors come into better balance with supply. Um, and I alluded to this earlier where we see increases in LFPR and labor supply from net immigration, as well as work from home dynamics, making work more available for people. Um, those certainly have helped and, and we would like to see that continue. You mentioned um, supply side normalization in the goods market. Um, do you think there's demand side normalization in the goods market as well beyond monetary policy induced um, demand changes? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of normalization and demand, you're right, um, in durable and non-durable goods. I mean, recently uh, we've seen uh, in the recent PC report that demand for, uh, for services, uh, which has been the main driver of consumption this year has kind of uh, broadened out to durable and non-durable goods again. Um, but in the beginning of the pandemic, you saw a real influx in goods-driven inflation, um, and but that's normalized over time. We saw core goods come down from over 5%, and now it's uh, kind of basically flat year over year. Uh, and that's come from normalization of, for example, used cars demand, uh, now, that being said, household balance sheets are still very strong right now, and they're over $2 trillion in excess savings. And so that's been a real surprising factor in the economy right now is why consumption growth uh, is so strong. And so, you know, we think that while demand in goods has normalized, um, it's not clear whether strong balance sheets would continue uh, fueling growth in the future. And to elaborate a bit on that balance sheets and excess savings point, it's, it's notoriously very difficult to measure excess saving. Many uh, studies show that there's trillions left. The San Francisco Fed released a study saying excess savings have been uh, exhausted and consumer demand uh, it shouldn't be driven by those excess balance, the excess asset side of the balance sheet for households. Uh, so that's a bit of a counterpoint to what Hyante just said. However, as I said, they're very difficult to measure. And given that excess savings decline is likely the uh, factor on the demand side that's least affected by monetary policy that's most impactful. Uh, it remains to be seen whether there's for further normalization there or whether consumer demand um, will will stay robust as as it's at its kind of long term steady state level. And just to add two more quick factors, one factor that may contribute to the further normalization of demand is the reduction in pent up demand from the pandemic, where people were kind of, uh, where we're using. Um, where people who were consuming less during the pandemic were now consuming more. However, that is slowly declining over time as seen by how holiday spending is on the decline, for instance. Secondly, the resumption of student loan payments by the Biden administration may also have the potential to tamp demand. Students and Chris drivers, there's two minutes left. Chris and um, um, I would like to follow up on the labor market questions. Um, you know, we've had a significantly tight labor market um, providing workers um, more um, bargaining power and seeing real wages increase. Um, one of the outcomes of that is in the organized labor sectors, they've been able to win back cost of living increases. Um, can you comment a little bit on how you see a built-in cost of living factor tied to inflation and how that will play to inflation going forward? It's a great question. Um, so, as you mentioned, sort of all canonical, uh, you know, models of worker uh, bargaining uh, 
sort of indicate that with higher vacancies relative to unemployment, that sort of increases the expected duration of a vacancy, which makes it more costlier for firms. And so they're willing to give uh, employees higher wages, which basically increases uh, worker bargaining power in a, in a period with high V over U. And indeed, we've seen, for example, uh, with the recent UAW auto worker strike, workers getting substantial wage gains for some workers up to 70%. Um, in terms of the sort of inflation uh, dynamics, what's important to, to understand is whether this is reflecting catch up wage gains or rather sort of entrenched higher inflation expectations that can fuel further inflation going forward. Um, as we, as as I mentioned earlier, we've seen nominal hourly earnings come down substantially. And so it's possible that the kind of uh, higher wage that we've seen in these recent sort of high profile worker bargaining uh, arrangements reflect more catch, of li catch up wages uh, in response to substantially high inflation we've seen over the past three years rather than kind of entrenched um, higher wages going forward. It's also worth noting the, that the wage question, like, excuse me, the question was about, yes, there's been catch up, but now going forward, more of them have built in an inflator, a, co a cost of living adjustment. So that's the question. I yeah, so, you know, we can think about this in terms of wage inflation that feeds into price inflation by raising firms unit labor costs. And if we think that wage inflation is driven by kind of changing expectations, yeah, judges, or your time is now up. All right. Thank you again for your time and your, for your participation in this year's virtual college fed challenge. Later this week, you'll receive an invitation to the winner announcement on November 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Later that day, a press release will also announce the winners. Winning video presentation and Q&A sessions will be uploaded to the board's website after the announcement. <clears throat> after Thanksgiving, we'll be in touch about supplying video Q&A sessions to all schools who participated. Please note, we've sent you an invitation for the College Fed Challenge open house in Washington, D.C. on Friday, February 9th, that, and there will also be a virtual option for this event. This event is for 2023 competition participants. They will be able to network with staff, competitors, and judges. It will also feature preparation and orientation for the 2024 College Fed Challenge. On behalf of the board's economic education team, thank you for competing in the virtual College Fed Challenge, and have a great remainder of your school year. Thanks all. Thanks for participating. Good job, thank everyone. You. Nice to meet everyone.